Good evening everyone and welcome to Monday Night Live. It's so good to be back in Australia and it's so good to be back here on Monday Night Live with you guys. Uh, so as per usual, we'll give it a couple of minutes and let everyone uh, tune in and uh, get settled and get a glass of water or wine or beer, whatever you're drinking and a piece of paper and a notepad if that's uh, a piece of paper and a pen. Uh, if you're a note taker and uh, obviously at the end of the Monday Night Live, if you send through your email address, uh, we can send you the notes from this show. We are a little bit behind or I'm a little bit behind on sending out the notes from previous shows. Uh, so we will get onto that for you. And if you are missing some previous notes, please let us know. Hey, Brett, thanks for letting me know that you're here. Welcome. Uh, if you are missing notes on the previous shows, please let us know, and, uh, and we'll certainly get them um, onto. Uh, we'll, we'll get them over to you as soon as we can. So uh, it's really good to be back in Australia. I landed on Wednesday. Uh, I had two days of preparation before I started our three-day advancing clinic, which I finished today. Uh, so I hit the ground running, so to speak, and uh, I'm really excited to. Um, be here and get back on schedule with the Monday Night Lives. We did, a, uh, I think I did one when I was in the United States, um, but we just couldn't get the timing right with the timing between Australia and there. And of course, we were running around between clinics and um, Cowboy Dressage World Finals and all that sort of stuff. So it was pretty hectic and uh, we couldn't, hey, mummy. Um, it was pretty hectic and I just couldn't pull it off uh, beyond the one that I already did. So I, I put the m on, um, hey, Destin. Gee, what time is it there? It must be, uh, you know, really early or really late or something like that. Uh, so, uh, it, yeah, like I say, it's great to be back. I'm, um, I'm pretty cool with the jet lag. I'm not too jet lagged at the moment, which is great. Uh, and like I said, I hit the ground running. We've just finished a three-day advancing clinic, which was absolutely amazing. Uh, we got some really cool stuff. They just get better and better. Um, all the clinics get better and better every time we do them. And uh, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm so chuffed and I'm so amazed. It was amazing um, to come home and, and have an advancing clinic to go to because I just got to touch base with everyone and see, um, you know, how much progress they've made with their horses. And we really got to take it to the next level. So it was really awesome. Um, hey Tracy, I did enjoy my time away. It was pretty busy. We had, um, you know, I did two clinics and Phil did one and then we had finals and top hand and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so we didn't get much time for sightseeing or anything like that, but, uh, you know, that wasn't the purpose of the trip. So we had a really good time in the States. Uh, hey Shirley, thanks for joining. Uh, so tonight's Monday Night Live is all about handling foals, young horses and stallions. Um, and I'm just going to go through a few tips, a few do's and don'ts. Obviously, we're in foaling season. I'm seeing a lot of foals uh, hitting the ground and... Um it's so it's really beautiful to see and i'm glad that so many of my uh clients and students and friends have uh beautiful healthy horses um you know being born which is so fantastic to see and i thought it'd be a great um topic to have for tonight's monday night live is you know how we can handle them and how we can make their um you know, uh, what I'm really passionate about when it comes to young horses is setting them up for life. So oh, sometimes our intent with a foal is, you know, we might be in a breeding program. So the intention is to sell them on. Sometimes our intention might be to keep them. And sometimes that intention might not necessarily come to fruition when we're talking five and 10 and 20 years down the track. We, we might not know exactly what's happening. Uh, so, we, you know, with that horse. And so I'm really passionate about making sure that our horses or these young horses and stallions get the education that they deserve in order to make them really good citizens and and really um, happy confident horses to handle uh, and you know that that's a huge thing when you when you look at sales and you look at horses that are getting run through the sales and things like that sometimes I haven't had the best start in life or the best um, handling early on in life and um, you know they, they turn into rogues or they turn into you know they get put in that hard to handle basket and there's there's uh, there's no need for that we can really uh, invest in them uh, early on in the piece and um, and make them really good uh, happy horses to handle and a pleasure to be around you know we were talking this weekend at the advancing clinic about how how nice it was to just have 
happy, confident horses to be around. We didn't have horses running or winning or doing this or doing that. It was just really nice to have these educated horses that were just happy to, you know, hang around with each other and listen to their owners and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, that's my thought process when it comes to our young horses. We need to be investing in them and in their future so they never end up in a situation where they've been put in a... Um, in a, uh, a too hard basket. So, hey, Eric, uh, I, I'm not sure about the endless energy. I'm, I'm, I'm giving it a red hot shot though. Uh, so I'm joining you from, um, a, you know, I'm at a friend's place. I'm in the spare room. I, we were invited over for dinner. So thank God, you know, I've got someone else cooking for me tonight because it probably wouldn't have happened. Uh, but yeah, let's get into it. Um, so firstly, I want to talk about foals. So um, there's a few things that I want to share when it comes to foals and handling them. And uh, some of these things are going to be repeated as we talk about stallions. Um, hey, Hillary. Um, uh, good to have you here. Hey, Ruth. No worries. You're late. We're only just getting started now. Um, so when it comes to foals and stallions, like I say, some of these things are going to cross over um, and they're just going to have a little bit of a different approach. So uh, I'm going to talk about foals first and then I'm going to talk about stallions. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about young young horses as in older than foals as we start to prepare them for um, being ridden. Please go ahead and... Um, Please go ahead and uh, write any questions or anything like that, and I'll try and address them as soon as I, uh, if I can, as long as I can see them as they're as they're coming through. So um, the first thing I want to uh, talk about when it comes to foals, rule number one is that we um, we initiate contact with foals. Uh, or accept or allow the contact with the foal. So obviously some foals are really curious and really bold and they'll come on right up to you. Um, and then some foals are a little bit shyer than that. And I want us to have uh, in our mind that we are um, either, you know, accepting or encouraging that behavior. I don't want a foal who's really bold to be able to uh, just come up and demand contact from me whenever they want. Um, obviously, foals that lack a little bit of confidence, you may encourage them to come up to you. And I'm certainly not saying to chase them away or anything like that. But what I am saying is that when, you know, if you think about a dog that runs up to you and jumps up on your chest and demands attention, we would address that and say, that's unacceptable behavior. I don't want you jumping on me and I don't want you demanding my attention either I'll give you um, attention uh, you know on my time sort of thing and so that's the kind of attitude that we need to have with our foals is you know we're not going to let them just come up and demand attention we might encourage it and we might accept their curiosity and, and them coming into us um, but we just have to have in the forefront of our mind who's initiating contact uh, and most importantly Hey Brooke, yeah, I never stop. I know, I, it, you know, I, we ha we're pretty busy at the moment. It's like a little reunion. I thought you guys would be so sick of hearing my voice after three full-on days, um, but it's great to have you here. Thanks for joining. Um, the most important part of this rule is we must ter we terminate the contact. So you never let your foal walk away from you. Um, your foal doesn't get to walk up and say, I want your attention, and then walk away and say, I'm, I don't want your attention anymore. Because if you allow your foal to initiate and terminate contact, then your foal thinks it's his decision when he gets your attention and when he does, no longer wants your attention. So what we want to be able to do is say to the foal, yes, I'm giving you my attention, and now I'm taking my attention away, and I've terminated the contact. So that's rule number one. I initiate or accept um, and I must terminate the contact. I, it's not my foal walking away from me. You can establish this ground rule when they're quite young. Sometimes you may have to just hold them a little bit. I'm not talking about wrestling with them or anything like that. Uh, but it'll, it may, like if they sort of start to walk away, you may have to just put a hand on them and say, no, 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 don't walk away. And then you go ahead and turn your back and walk away from them. And then the foal goes, okay, you, you walk away from me. I don't walk away from you. So that's rule number one. Uh, you know, don't let your foal initiate and terminate contact at their will. That's your job. Rule number two, and I see this all the time, 
please do not accept behavior that you are not going to accept later on. So I know when foals are little, it's really, really cute when they come up and they nibble on you and they come up and headbutt you and demand, hey, babe, uh, in the next room, thanks for joining and watching. Um, you know, I know it's really cute when they bump their head on you and demand a pat. I know it's really cute when they rub their head on you. I know it's really cute when they turn their bum at you and try and scratch on you. I know it's really cute when then they start humping up and down and kicking out at you and, and practicing all this stuff. But it's not going to be cute when they're older. It's not behavior that they're going to accept. Someone really loved that, um, that, that message. Um, Bessie can do no wrong, Hillary's saying. Yeah, you know, I know it's really cute and, I, you know, I'm a sucker for it too. But you're not doing them any favors allowing them to do all of those behaviors because there's going to be a point, whether it's when they're six months old or one, month, one year old or one and a half or two or when they go to the trainer or when you want to ride them, that you're going to say, you know what, I don't want you to kick me anymore. I don't want you to bite me anymore anymore I don't want you to do this stuff anymore and then the horse is gonna say well why I'm they don't know that they're any bigger or smaller than than they were before they don't understand that they were super cute and then you know you let them get away with stuff so no behavior that you don't want later on you know you've got to look at that foal as hard as hard as it is sorry my, I'm losing my voice and my words are getting difficult to get out um, as hard as it is you need to look at that foal at like they're a horse and that brings me to point number three you must treat your foal like they are a horse so you know observe any behavior that's unacceptable you uh, expect certain things from them you know you wouldn't let your horse um lead you or 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 get in front of you and walk away so don't let your foal do it um you know don't let your foal you know bump into you or knock you over or any of those things that you're not going to want them to be able to do when they're old it, that, you know, you immediately have to address that. And this this live isn't particularly about me telling you how to address these things. And I'm certainly not saying that you need to punish the horse because obviously they're just feeling their way. But from day one, foals are going to be trying to find their boundaries. So, you, you know, you'll see it with, the, you know, in the herd. You know, they'll go up to certain other horses and they'll go, oh, you know, they do the mouth thing and they go, oh, I'm a little baby, you know, hi, how are you? And then they might get a bit cheeky and say, oh, can I bump into you? And the horse goes, no, you can't do that to me because you're a foal and I'm I'm, a, I'm above you in the pecking order. So, oh, okay, that's a boundary. So we must treat them like a horse and um, establish boundaries from day dot. Um, foals need company and they need social skills. So the greatest gift or the greatest thing that you can do for a foal is to make sure that they are part of a herd. Um, not necessarily straight away because, um, you know, obviously you would have concerns maybe. I mean, I know people that let them get born in a herd and the herd is like a big family group and there's no, you know, there's never been any issue there and things like that. Uh, but if you're a little bit worried about them getting attacked or trodden on or kicked or something like that in those first few sort of delicate weeks of their life, no problem at all. But as soon as you, they're, you know, two or three weeks old, they need to be in a, in a herd, in a part of a herd that is, um, is going to teach them social skills. Um, one of the best things that you can do for a foal is actually put them in, you know, have maybe two or three mares that are, have all got foals and then all the foals go in together because what the mares are going to do, the mares are going to act like mummy and aunties and the aunties and the mother are going to teach them um, boundaries and, and um, you know, what they are and aren't allowed to do. And then the other foals are also going to say, I don't like that and I like that, but they're going to give them um, the social skills of play and, and uh, company and things like that. So, the you know the greatest um setup that you can have for your foal is one of a, a you know a functioning herd um playing that you, that continues on number 5 is playing is good for their development so if you can get them into a paddock with other foals or other young horses or horses that are happy to play um, playing is really good for their development. They, they, uh, they, you know, not only are they learning social skills, but they're learning skills of balance and, you know, running around and rearing up at each other and biting and all that sort of stuff. And it's a natural thing for a foal to want to play. So you're giving them an outlet for all of that stuff without them, 
thinking that you're the outlet for that stuff. Foals are naturally going to try and play and they're going to try and, um, you know, establish a hierarchy with each other. Well, if they don't have some another foal to play with, they're going to go ahead and try and do that with you. And they're going to do it to the other horses in the herd as well. They're going to constantly look for another horse to play with and another horse to play fight with and uh, and learn these skills so when you observe colts playing together they will demonstrate male um tendencies and male skills so they will typically play fight all the time because that's what they need to know in order to protect their herd and uh when you look at females or fillies play what they learn to do is herd each other because they're learning how to have a baby and and push it around and and um and manage a foal that's walking around so you'll notice that males and females play very differently and then when they interact together that that, that interaction is very different again uh, the final thing that i want to say when it comes to foals is that you are training your foal from day one and that doesn't mean that you are to um, do you know you're not meant to pull your foal out and do a one hour training session with it but what i'm saying is that from day one you're either educating your fo your well from day one, you're educating your foal. You're either putting stuff in there that is going to cause him to be a great, easy to handle horse, or you're putting stuff in there that's going to cause him to be a nuisance and have behavioral problems that other people or yourself are going to want to fix in the future. So when it comes to um, training your foals, you don't need to set aside a, and do a training session. But what I do want to do with my foals is, uh, you know, some of the things, one of the things that I like to establish straight away is my foal, say, yielding to my touch. So one of the first things that I do with the, with the, uh, studs that I work with when I work with their foals one of the first things that I'll do is put my hand on the foals chest and their instinct is to push into that hand I I, I, I feel that they're pushing into my hand I allow that pressure to happen and then the minute that they back off my hand I, I leave my hand alone. Now, I might only do that for one repetition for the first two or three weeks. And then I might ask them for a second step and a third step. And then one day I'm going to ask them to do the same thing with their hind quarter. And then one day I'm going to ask them to do the same thing with their fore quarter. So for, for foal training, it's not a big you know, session where you've got to put a halter on or you've got to do this or you've got to do that. Sometimes it's as simple as putting your hand somewhere and saying, just step over here. Just step over there. And if you get that timing and the release correct, you're going to have a foal that, or a horse that is extremely um, easy to handle you know, from day one. So that brings me to handling stallions. So some of those things, all of the things that we spoke about when it comes to foals apply to stallions. But I also want to talk specifically about stallions now. So the rule number one that I have about stallions is don't go overboard just because they're a stallion, okay? Um, we're conditioned from the time we're quite um, young or, or from, from, from sort of early on in our horse career, um, our horse exposure, when we become a horsey person, um, most of the time when we speak about stallions, someone is there saying, oh, it, it, it's doing this because it's a stallion. Oh, he, you know, he's, he's, don't go in there because it's a stallion. Don't touch him because it's a stallion. So we put all these uh, walls up and we, and we give these horses all these excuses to be nasty or bitey or whatever. Oh, he does that because he's a stallion. No, we, you know, Phil and I, when we, when both of our horses were stallions, we could take them out in public anywhere. You know, we kids could go up and touch them. They could be tied to our float and no one would even know they were a stallion. They used to go to competitions and no one would know they were a stallion. It was, you know, it was before you had to put big green identification discs on them. Um, you know, I did lots of clinics with my stallion and I'd have someone else in the clinic and ride underneath his nose with a with a mare that was in season and he wouldn't even nicker. Uh, we never had to bash our stallions because they were stallions. We didn't bash it out of our horses. What we did was we treated them as geldings with nuts. 
Okay, so that was a, that was a running statement out at home. He's just a gelding, but he happens to have nuts, so he's not allowed to go in with the mares. Or you know, I'm I'm not going to deliberately antagonize him by putting a mare in season under his nose. But the everything else, you know, he was he was handleable all year round. You know, I know some people have months of the year where they can't handle their stallions because they're breeding. Our horses were handleable day in day out, doesn't matter when. Um, you know, and everything that we wanted to do riding, rugging, feeding, going in the paddock with them, didn't matter what we wanted to do, we were able to do everything with them because we just treated them like, you know, you're just a stallion, you just happen to still have your bits. It's like a, um, a you know, it's a curious thing with stallions because when you meet an entire male dog, you don't say, oh, you know, it's an entire male, don't do anything with it. You, you know, it's no big deal. He's still expected to sit and he's still expected to wait for his dinner and still expected to be respectful. And all of a sudden when we have stallions, we expect that they're going to be hard to handle and rogues and they're going to be biting and they're going to be doing all this stuff. Um, you know, you need to treat that horse um, like you, you know, you need to have the same expectations for that horse as you would with any other horse. Um, number two, again, behavior that is going to be trouble later on. If you didn't think it was important when we were talking about foals, it's exponentially important with stallions only because your stallion is going to preserve his instinct to uh, bite because that's you know they'll grab onto the mare's neck he's going to preserve his instinct to jump because he's going to jump onto mares so there's things like that that if when I spoke about it in the foal section you were kind of like oh you know I think I can handle it because the foal's really cute when it comes to your stallion or your colt you're not going to let him bite you you're not going to let him jump up or rear up at you or anything like that because some of those behaviors are stallion related behaviors so he is still going to have the instinct to do them when he's two and three and four and five and six so you need to address right now no matter what the age of the horse what that boundary is and no you're not allowed to rear up at me no you're not allowed to use your teeth on me even today uh no yesterday we were in our herd paddock cooper was a stallion for a long time he was gelded when he was um maybe four or five he never served so he never worked but he was um he did show stallion like behaviors and even today and he is now probably nine years old um even yesterday when we were in the paddock he walked up to a mare that i was working with and and bit her on the neck and tried to sort of hold her position um and that's you know a horse that's never worked yes he was a stallion for four years or five years until we we gelded him um but the instinctual thing is still in there and he hasn't he's not been a stallion for five years so um you know stallions have that instinct preserved in them so any behavior that is stallion related um you know nip it in the bud now and i'm not saying to bash the horse but i am saying to address the behavior Number three is super, super, super important. It's one of the most vital things when it comes to stallions. Please understand that your stallion still needs company. We still, uh, we still to this day, we see so many stallions running alone because he's a stallion. Um, he, if he's got great benefit, he may have a mare put in with him for breeding purposes, but he then, the mare goes away and, uh, and then he's back to his life of isolation. So what we do with, um, uh, I, I've got a client that breeds um, fjords here in Coffs Harbour and what we have done with her stallion is we have always made sure that he has had company. So that when he first arrived and he was quite a young stallion, he was put in with uh, two other colts that she had bred. So he was three and they were maybe one year old um, and he had those horses to play with. Oh, no, actually, I think the first horse that he got to play with was a gelding. He was in with a gelding. And then he was put in with the colts. Then when he started breeding, he was put in with um, a couple of mares for breeding purposes. And then when they became pregnant, he was still living with them. So they were not taken out of his paddock until it came time for them to fold down. Now, this stallion, I haven't, uh, I'm not sure of the exact 
um, management of him right now, but he is a happy, healthy stallion because he is able to either run with mares that he's going to breed with or pregnant mares, which is excellent for his education because he understands that it's not his job to just jump on a mare whenever he wants to. She's got to give him permission to jump on. And he's also been with other geldings and colts, so he knows how to play um, and be social in that way. So please don't isolate your stallion just because he's a stallion. Please find company for him to be, you know, they need they need company. All of our horses need company so they sleep well, so they play, so they um, have mutual grooming, so they have social skills. Having them next to something is fine, but it's not the same as having company in the paddock. Uh, number four, when it comes to stallions, if you've got a stallion that you're just starting to um, breed with or you're contemplating breeding with, please, uh, the way that we we um, handled our stallions and the way that um, we've handled the stallions at the studs that I've um, consulted with is we have always put mares in that, yes, we want them to get pregnant, but we have put them in when they are not in season. So what happens there is the mares say no. For two or three days, that stallion gets told, no, I'm not ready. No, I'm not ready. No, I'm not ready. So the stallion learns that no means no, and he's not just going to be a rogue that ends up raping mares, which if, um, you know, I unfortunately I've heard of lots of stallions that get to that point because they are always served on a mare Sorry, they are always served on a mare that's in full season and that is like, yep, ready to go. In big breeding facilities or with expensive stallions, they may hobble the mare so she can't kick out, she can't say no. So he's basically being taught to be a rapist, okay? I've seen injuries on mares um, because that is the situation, because that that stallion has never heard no for an answer. So he think, wow. He's allowed, he's allowed to just get on there. Even if the man's saying no, he, he goes ahead and does it anyway. So please, please, please educate your stallion and let your understand, let your stallion know that no, it means no. Put mares in there that have had foals before. My recommendation is put mares in there that have had foals before so they understand what he is going to do. They're not just a maiden mare that's going to kick him you know, because she doesn't understand the process. But put them in when they are not in season. So they say no, no, no. And then when they come into season, then they will allow him and you will have a, a well-mannered, nice stallion that people are happy to send their mares to because he's not just going to jump on them and do whatever he wants whenever he wants to. So, I mean, that's probably the most important thing I can say when it comes to um, your stallion and teaching him the social skills. Now, I know that there's probably some people out there saying, my stallion cost, uh, you know, $100,000 and I can't afford for him to get kicked. And I, I, I really, really understand that. And my answer to that, and I know some people are not going to like that, uh, my, my answer is that, um, one, if you want a stallion that is well-behaved and well-mannered and a gentleman with his mares, you must educate him. Two, horses are horses. They are going to kick out. They are going to do stuff. So there's always a risk of injury to any horse when you put it in a paddock, not even talking about stains anymore, geldings with each other, mares with each other, whatever, it doesn't matter. Number three, get your stallion insured so you are not at a financial deficit if an injury occurred that was so great that you were to lose your stallion or that he was unable to breed any longer. I know that sounds harsh, but the reality is you can either have a rogue stallion that's worth a lot of money, that psychology that is psychologically damaged, that is a rapist, that's hard to handle, that is abusive to mares that come in underneath him, or you can run the risk that he may get kicked, um, which is only going to be a little kick on his chest or something like that. And if he's respectful enough and goes away, you're going to create a beautiful, well-mannered mannered gentleman that is going to build a reputation for being a gentleman with mares and more mares are going to come in to um, be served by your stallion. Um, number five is to recognize um, stallion behavior. 
So um, some things that our mares do or some things that our geldings do is probably behaviour that we might accept on a general uh, in, in a general way. Um, and, but we have to understand that when our stallion does that behaviour, that it is actually stallion behaviour. And we want to address it um, because my stallion, when he goes out in public with me, is not a stallion anymore. He's a gelding. So I'll, I'll tell you a little story. You know, I used to take my horse, uh, we used to take our stallions um, to team penning. And um, one day I was riding around at team penning and I walked into the arena and Cooper started to um, do the lip up in the air thing, you know, this kind of thing. And he was, you know, shaking his head and he had his lip up in the air. And I was like, oh, you know, what, you know, what's happening here? What's he doing? And Phil, who was riding next to me at the time, said, you need to stop that. He's, at, he's doing stallion behavior. So he had obviously caught the scent of a mare or he, uh, you know, maybe a mare had, had um, urinated or something like that that and I went okay we need you know I, I needed to say to him no you're not a stallion out when you're out and about you're a gilding it was as simple as that so you know gilding uh, stallions when they're licking is um foreplay basically so when your stallions uh, licking you know I wouldn't let your stallion lick your hands and things like that um smelling or or de demanding that they smell um manure urine all that sort of stuff that stallion behavior um squealing um, trying to drive you, so putting their ears back and trying to send you away, any of those types of behaviours that you feel like is, uh, you know, the nickering, the really strong, like, uh, you know, nickering kind of thing, you need to address that. Um, any kind of behaviour like that where the stallion begins to present to the mare, so when he starts to build up and, and squeal and, and uh, demonstrate, you know, how beautiful he is and that she should breed with him because he's, she's going to have a beautiful baby, uh, you need to interrupt that behavior, especially when you're out and about. So um, one of the rules that we used to have with our stallions is that they never served, well, Cooper didn't serve, but George, um, he never served anywhere else but home. So when we took him out and about, it was always, George, you're a gelding, you're out and about. So any kind of stallion behavior, a mare in season might walk past and he'd be all like, look at me, I'm, you know, I'm a stallion, you should breed with me. And we'd say, no not in public, you're not allowed to act like a stallion, you're a gelding when you're out in public. So any kind of stallion behaviors that the horse does anywhere but you where he is meant to serve a mare, um, it, he's not allowed to do. And, and that brings me to uh, uh, having specific paddocks and places that your stallion is allowed to serve because horses will begin to build an association um, with things that they're allowed to um, uh, serve around. So maybe if you're doing um, AI or something like that, your horse will begin to associate the vets with serving because they understand, like, get off the float, the dummy's there, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to and I'm gonna serve. Um, you know, if you serve them at home and a float pulls in, you know, at our old place where, when George was a stallion and we did have outside mares coming in, someone might come over to do a, uh, have a ride with us and he'd see the float coming and he'd start saying, oh, yeah, you know, I've got a mare coming, um, which we might address the behavior if we were in the paddock with him. But beyond that, we used to say, you know what, that's normal because he, he's got an association with when a float arrives, a mare gets put in the paddock with me and I, and I get to serve. So um, there's a time and a place for your horse to be a stallion. All the other times and all the other places, he's a gelding. So you address the behavior and you don't allow the behavior to happen. Uh, number seven is the same as what we spoke about with foals. You initiate and terminate the contact. So your stallion isn't allowed to come up to you and demand that he gets padded and he's not allowed to walk away from you and tell you that he's had enough. Okay, so um, I'm not saying that you're going to force him to accept your, um, you know, your affection. But, if, you know, if he comes up and says, oh, hey, how are you going? And then goes to walk away, you are going to say, no, 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 you stay with me, have a pat, and then I'm going to walk away from you. You don't get to walk away from you. Uh, you don't get to walk away from me. Um, number eight is uh, just recognizing the fact that uh, stallions are because of their testosterone and the hormones and all that sort of stuff. And uh, you know, we always have joke about jokes about this at clinics. Uh, obviously, mares have hormones and things like that going on, but mares are all about um, 
uh, breeding and keeping control of the kids and looking after the herd and making sure the herd's eating and drinking and moving on wherever they're supposed to go. Uh, whereas stallions pretty much, you know, they're looking to eat, drink, breed, eat, drink, breed. So um, stallions can get themselves into um, excitable states because of, of a lack of stimulus. So you need to recognize that stallions do require a higher level of stimulus in terms of um, mental stimulation. So uh, making sure that, like I said, we've spoken about already, making sure that they've got company. But, you know, stallions love, coop. my, my stallion went, when Cooper was a stallion, he used to absolutely adore Liberty. I, uh, you know, he he, and he still does to this day. But when he was a stallion, he used to love me coming in the paddock and sort of asking him to do things, teaching him new things all the time. Stallions really absorb that. Um, they like being taught new things. They like being right. They like having your company. Um, they do require a higher level of stimulation than a general horse who's happy to sort of just eat grass in the paddock. Stallions will eat grass grass for you know an hour and then say oh you know what's happening let's do something they want to do things you know uh so if they're not breeding and they don't have other um you know if they've only got one other horse in the paddock with them making sure that you spend the time to uh you know teach them new things and continue on with their training at all times is going to make sure that you've got a happy healthy stallion um I want to now talk about young horses uh, and only briefly because the foal handling and the stallion handling is exactly what we do with our young horses as well. But as our horses start to um, grow older and we're starting to get closer to when they are going to uh, be riding horses, uh, we want to make sure that we are developing a citizen. So all of those basics that uh, we take for granted probably with horses uh, that are that are older we want to make sure that our that our young horses are very consistent with so i'm talking about things like leading picking up your feet getting rubbed getting wormed getting groomed standing still being tied up um you know um being groomed being washed all of those things are going to make a difference about how your horse performs under saddle it doesn't sound like it's um relative but what we tend to do is make the mistake of thinking oh i've taught my horse to pick its feet up it knows how to pick its feet up and every four weeks when the when the trimmer or the farrier comes around he can pick its feet up it doesn't work that way um horses need consistency so you're better off picking those feet up every day and teaching the horse to pick his feet up um uh, you know on a consistent basis and remaining calm the same as grooming and washing and all that i'm not saying wash your horse every day but i'm saying do it on a regular basis and then the horse begins to understand that that's part of his normal routine so i call that building a citizen and that's um something we talk about a lot in in um you know cult starting clinics and things like that so um i hope that those uh tips were informative for you and uh and you are um able to apply them with your foals your young horses your stallions um please go ahead and put any questions in the comments and i'll address them now if they come up now otherwise go ahead and put them in and i can address them uh either if you want to send me a question by a private message or something like that um you know i'm happy to answer questions we will have an information sheet available for you um over the next couple of days and uh and we'll we will uh we'll send them out to you uh so thank you so much for joining our first Monday Night Live back um, from uh, for the last month. So uh, first Monday Night Live for October. You're welcome. All the thank yous are coming in. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I'm sure I'm going to see a lot of you soon. I'm about to head up to um, Cabarita Beach this weekend. And then I head up to Cedar Grove um, for two clinics back to back up there. And uh, and then uh, I come back to Glen Ray for a foundation clinic where we're going to start covering a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, the foundation clinic is for young horses to come out to. Um, and, you know, that, that's where we really get into the um, nuts and bolts of, of exactly what skills we're going to be teaching those horses and how to make them really uh, confident, happy, happy. Um, 
uh, ridden horses and and horses that are a, a joy to have around and a joy to handle. So confidence and consistency is always paramount with any handling that you do with your horses. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I hope everyone has a great week. Uh, thanks, Brooke. I will definitely grab myself a glass of wine and uh, and relax. Thank you, and I will talk to you all very shortly. Bye.